Great. So a lot of what Luke just went over, um, you, you saw like it, they, you do the, um, there's a lot of JavaScript that you, like a lot of boilerplate JavaScript that you have to keep doing for every element that you want to create. So a Polymer has abstracted a lot of that stuff out and have simplified the process a lot. So it's a lot easier to create Shadow DOM and create uh, your custom elements. So how many people have actually looked at Polymer? OK. How many people have actually built something with Polymer, or at least tried <laughs> building something with Polymer? Oh, uh, three. All right. All right. So I've tried twice. And um, the first time wasn't so successful. It's a work in progress. The second time, actually, I built something this weekend. I'm really proud of it, but it's really simple. But I think it does a great job of showing all of the things that you can do with Polymer and Shadow DOM and custom elements. So um, if you haven't seen this yet, uh, this is, uh, so I attended just about every Polymer event at Google I.O. So um, I feel like I, I've seen, like, seen the light, I guess, a little bit. Um, I, I saw the light with Angular, and now I think I'm seeing the light with, with Polymer. So uh, they they demoed this. This is called Topeka, and if you haven't seen this yet, this is their uh, sort of their demonstration application that really shows off what Polymer can do. So let me just it's a quiz application, and it's I think it's pretty cool. So um, and it uses if you can see down here this is a um, this is part of their material design so they've got a whole set of paper elements um, that you can just drop into your application and they're going to have all these cool CSS three effects and gradients and this ripple effect and this other thing they call ink so let's see here so uh, you, it, the animation really wasn't that good on the screen there um, because it's over video but on an actual device or on your laptop it's super smooth. One thing that they focused on was making sure that all their animations ran at 60 frames per second. And I know that's that's pretty courageous because uh, it doesn't always happen. But from what I've seen, very little stutter, uh, very few drop frames. So um, this is part of what Google is, is pushing with L, is this whole sort of transition. Um, so when you select an element, you'll see that it sort of takes over the whole screen. Uh, you're not like transitioning to a new page. It, it actually becomes the whole, you know, it takes up the entire viewport. And then, um, does anybody know the answer to this? First words spoken on the moon by Buzz Aldrin were these. Has anyone done this before? But Buzz Aldrin didn't. That was Armstrong. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to be first. Oh, you know what it was? I think it was. Who's the guy that walked on there? Glenn? Uh, Ar what? Neil Armstrong. Get back in here, Neil. Is that what he said? Something oh. like that. Anyway, so you go through this whole thing, and you, there's, they have all the, they have like 10 questions per category, but the, the whole time they're they're doing uh, I think it was that's wrong I, I chose that uh, Reagan I don't know Reagan don't Johnson know. Jimmy Carter <laughs> anyway so this thing oh that was right so I got any points but uh, so this kind of each. I think does a really good job of demonstrating what they're trying to do with uh, transitions and trying to think of creating single page applications and having them be a much more immersive experience rather than your typical you know page to page fade in fade out type of deal. And then uh, the other thing you can look at is this leaderboard where you can see that there have been plenty of people that have done this over and over and over again and they did it right. I have no idea how this person got nice. Well, it seems like they manipulated. OK, so that's, um, I, I, would, I would recommend Googling that. And, and so much of what I've learned is by looking at their source code. It's on GitHub. So you can see how they pass data around, how they create all these different transitions. 
It's uh, definitely worthwhile. All right, moving on. So I hope that knocked your socks off. Um, so they recommend using Bower to get started. Um, you can download the zip file from GitHub, but they I can't remember what the specific reason was. They said not to do that. Uh, I think there are some other things that you have to do to get it up and running. Um, but the best way to stay up to date and make sure you've got all of the latest versions is to use Bower. Um, so you would, if you haven't used Bower before, these are just the simple commands that you would use. Um, you would get the Polymer, and then uh, if you want to use, you don't have to use their uh, web components, but it's a lot, it's like using Bootstrap where you can just really quickly get something up and running and it looks nice. So you can grab their, uh, some of their predefined elements um, either from core elements or paper elements. Okay, so um, using Polymer, I think, is, a, is, is really, it's really straightforward. Um, really, the only thing that you need to do is the very first script tag that you include on the page needs to be platform.js, which you'll find in the, um, when you download all the files from, from Bower, or from GitHub, I guess, that's where it's coming from. And then to use an element, you do just like Luke said, where you would import uh, the particular element that you would like to use. In this case, I thought it would be cool to use the core toolbar. And then to, oops, to get the core toolbar to work, I just add the core toolbar to the page. And then you can see the result is I have a core toolbar. That's really cool, huh? <laughs> yeah, who's in Oz? So that was one element. Then uh, I think Luke showed creating a couple elements. Well, let's say you want to use a whole bunch of elements. You know, it's really easy. So um, this is an example from their page. This uses a core toolbar. It uses their these things called paper tabs. And then you've got these uh, icon buttons that have the cool little press effect behind them. Um, and here's another button that's an icon, uh, with the menu, the hamburger. And then if we looked at the HTML for this, there's some simple styling here. Uh, but at the top, you see all I did was just include all of those different elements. Let me make that larger. Just include the elements from the uh, from the polymer stuff, and then you just start adding it to the page. It's it's just like I mean my my experience has been a, it's a lot like Bootstrap, you know, copy and paste predefined chunks of HTML. Make sure you import the right things, drop it in, and you'll have a pretty cool looking application just from simple copy-paste. Um, and then there's just a couple other things that I want to touch on with this. They have, uh, they, have some, they have a whole series of attributes that you can use that help define layout. Um, so this first one here on the body tag you'll see is unresolved. So what that does is the unresolved attribute will hide all unrendered or un... I guess, comp I, guess I don't want to use the word compile, but... Um, not quite created elements to the page. And then it runs, if you look at the CSS, if you have uh, something with the unresolved attribute, you'll see it does a, a nice little CSS3 transition fade in. So as soon as all everything has been, is, is ready to be shown on the, in the viewport, it'll run a, an animation on it and show it. And then full bleed is this other attribute that you can add so you can make sure that your whatever that you put on the screen takes up the entire width. You won't have any borders. So you'll notice at the top, I don't have any, uh, well, there's margin zero. Um, so me. <laughs> anyway, so full bleed will take up the whole screen. And then within each of the... Uh, Within each of the different elements, they can have their they have their own classes that you can add that they also have documented. Any questions about this so far? 
most of what I'm showing you right now is straight from the polymerproject.org website. I don't want you guys to think I'm cheating you by <laughs> doing that. I once I once attended training for Backbone, and Luke was there, and the guy started talking about underscore, and he went to the underscore web page and went line by line <laughs> through each item. It was like very this is this is very how this is what it does. Cool. All right. So as I mentioned, Polymer. Um, Polymer, the platform itself, you can use uh, to handle a lot of the boilerplate JavaScript that Luke was showing, where they sort of abstract that away, and it's a lot simpler. Uh, Polymer, can, you can also get their core elements and their paper elements, and I'll just show you those really quick. Um, here's the documentation. Here's the documentation. <laughs> I'm not going to go diving through these. <laughs> But they have, there's a, they've, they've already put a lot of effort into this and building out a lot of your standard things that you would do, uh, like abstracting out AJAX calls. So you can use their core AJAX tag, and it'll do everything that you need to do with you know, retrieving a resource or getting some JSON. Um, you know, drag and drop, they, they've abstracted that away from you, so you can just drop that tag on the page. Uh, one that I really like is this core header panel. Uh, you can do some really cool things with that, and as well as the um, any of these core icons or core icon buttons, those are those are pretty cool. And then they also have their uh, paper elements, and this is where they've made a lot of effort or lot, they put a lot of focus into replicating the material design on the web. And one of the things that they were focusing on at I/O is how can we have a consistent look across tablets, across watches, across you know, our web pages. And so it was actually really nice to see that the web was included in all of the nice things that they've, they've done to Android, and that the, the, the Polymer team did a great job of making it look just like you would see in a native application. Um, so real quick, this is, this is a fun one, Paper Ripple, if you haven't seen this. All you have to do is add the Paper Ripple tag to, the, to your page. And then here, let's, let's click on one of these. Ah, didn't look very good. So that, <laughs> that's kind of cool. The animation is obviously really slow in the video, but uh, on your device or on your, your computer, it's going to look pretty soon. OK, so Luke showed you how you create your own element using the real, I guess, the native way of doing it. Um, if you want to create your own element the Polymer way, uh, the, it's really just a couple of steps. You would create your, or you would, you would link in the Polymer HTML file, which has all of the JavaScript that it needs to run to actually convert what you're doing with your Polymer element to a, um, <coughs> to a web component. And then you, so you would create a Polymer hyphen element. You would give it a name, and it has to have the same convention that Luke was mentioning, where it has to have a dash in it. Uh, so I created uh, my element. For Luke to get his stuff to run, he had to do some boilerplate JavaScript. If you add a no script attribute to your, to your tag, it, it will do everything that it needs to do to instantiate itself and actually show up on the screen. So if you actually don't have any JavaScript that you're going to run with your if it's really just a paragraph that says this is my really cool element and you're not doing any sort of manipulation or any calculations or anything, add the no script attribute and it just magically shows. However, if you do leave the no script attribute off, it won't show up. It'll be <laughs> blank. So fair warning. So here it is in action. My really Whoa. cool element in my HTML. If somebody's attacking my portals right now. <laughs> it's not me. Have you guys played Ingress? Have if you anyone needs it? an invite, let me know. Holy cow, that game is <laughs> can ruin a marriage. It's true. So the code to get my really cool element to show up on the page is all I did was include the uh, platform.js file. I added a link to myelement.html and then added my element to the page, and 
it shows. I think that is a lot. Um, I think that's a lot simpler than what Luke was showing. And I hate to say that because I feel like when you can use native or you know pure JavaScript, use it so you don't become reliant on a library. I mean, how many people? I mean, it's like you know, query selector all is this method that has been abstracted away by jQuery. And so when you ask somebody to you know, find an element using pure JavaScript, they, they may not be able to actually grab it, which I think is a little sad. But it's <laughs> no, just the, 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 it's the, the, the sad it, thing is when you say, do you know JavaScript? They're like, yeah, I know jQuery. Yeah. <laughs> OK. I don't know about you guys, but I really think I'm starting to get the hang of this. So now that I can create an element, uh, I know how to use multiple elements together, the next step is to think, OK, well, what am I going to build with this? And one thing that I've been reading on the Polymer site is they want you to think of everything as a component. I mean, down to the smallest thing. I mean, even think of, think of non UI elements, like the Core Ajax element that they've created. There's actually no UI with that tag at all, but it's something that it's done frequently. I mean, making Ajax recalls is something that people do over and over and over again, so they created a tag that sort of abstracts that all away and makes it simple. So I sort of started getting my inspiration. I love music. Um, I like, I kind of range between uh, metal and sort of like techno and then some softer stuff in between. I like how you don't say what the softer stuff is. Oh, well, I mean, I've got it, so like, uh, I'm trying to think. I'm pretty sure I saw. You can see my Gwen Stefani, like Cars and Despicable Me. What's Gwen Stefani's band? No doubt? Yeah. They're in your library. I've seen them. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's right. Yeah, that's, <laughs> anyway, so. Um, and let me find, there's uh, one other page. Let me find this really fast. <laughs> so Google Music was one uh, place that I sort of thought, you know, this would be kind of cool to recreate. And then this, this little guy right here, I saw this. And the animation, once again, is not great because it's on video, but on my screen it looks pretty smooth. This is, once, this is an example of what they're shooting for with making a meaningful transition using their uh, material design. So I thought, OK, let's, let's try that. Oh, and back to what I was saying about thinking of everything as a component. <laughs> like, this, you know, think of all of these songs as components. Think of the navigation here as a component. Think of this as a component. You know, the profile stuff, each one of these could be their own component. It's like when you put on a little bell, it does its own little thing. So you could just create like the my bell, my bell. Beastie <laughs> Boys? OK, so I created this thing here. Let me hide this. It's called the Polymer Player. So I thought, OK, it might be cool to have it be a web page that you could load up on your phone and you could start playing your music. Uh, you could easily wrap this in PhoneGap. I've done, I've already wrapped a couple of things, or at least one application in PhoneGap. And I'm telling you, if you, hand, if you hand an Android phone to an iOS guy and you've got an application running in PhoneGap, and you start doing some of this polymer stuff with the uh, or the paper elements, they don't know that it's not native. I, I'm I've been looking for something like this, and I've played around with you know jQuery Mobile and I, the Ionic framework, like Top Coat, and some other things. This is the first sort of set of elements in you know CSS and JavaScript that I've seen that really does look awesome on a device, especially Android. All right, so when I was creating the Polymer or the Polymer player, uh, these are just uh, these are actually all the tags that I used, and then I created a bunch of my own that sort of encapsulate all of these other things. So here's how it looks on the web. So this would be the desktop version, um, and I'm just going to turn this around so you can. 
get a better idea as to like how the how the transitions actually look. Okay, I mean that's pretty smooth. And then you know I made it responsive, of course, because I'm a mobile guy. So when you drag it down. And then you can replay the song. I mean, it, it's it's really simple demo, and I actually have music playing in my local host. <laughs> I was gonna, I I contemplated uploading the songs, and then I thought somebody <laughs> would get me in trouble for making MP3s um, distributable on GitHub. Probably not a good idea. Okay, so I just want to take a brief moment here to take a look at the code so you can sort of see where did it go. All right, this is this is my favorite part. My whole application is an element. <laughs> So you could you could grab this whole application in that one element, drop it onto the right side of your web page, your blog, whatever you want. Just grab that tag, import it, drop it in, and it's going to render and you know do its thing. And that, that's where I think they're they're really trying to go with with web components. If you were to look at some of the Google components that they're creating, you can have an entire Google Maps application running on your web page just by importing the Google Map tag. And you know, you have access to all the, the pieces of the of the JavaScript API through attributes, through events, and things like that. So I I I really think that this is powerful stuff. And if if I'm overzealous here, <laughs> somebody <laughs> Somebody tell me. Um, so then what I've done, though, is I've created, like, if you were to look at my application, you would see that, OK, well, when you click on a, when you click on a song, you've got a, or, yeah, it was a, or an album cover, it shows a song. So I created an element called player song. And then I've got the, the one view that shows all of the songs. So I created an element called player songs. And then at the bottom, we've got the controls, and then we've got the overarching just player app um, component. So to do the, uh, to do the songs, the, the, the view where you saw the, the scrolling list, um, you know, I just imported some of the core elements from, from Polymer, did a simple repeat over a array full of songs and you'll see you'll see some similarities between angular and polymer and i've seen also a lot of articles about how people think that polymer is going to replace angular and then i've also seen people say that polymer is going to be absorbed by angular and i think and somebody correct me if I'm wrong I really think they are going to live separately because there's a lot of things that angular does as far as you know building out a, a full-blown application that polymer is not really good at I think polymer is more about creating the reusable elements I know that in the do you did you raise your hand or oh, okay sorry <laughs> um, I, I really think like so polymer doesn't even have a router built in and if you want to use a router with polymer you know if you want to do hash changes they encourage you to use this thing called flatiron director which I haven't tried yet once again it is a web component <laughs> which I think is cool uh, but there's no there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to combine all of this polymer stuff with your angular application so um, when it gets into the, the repeat part here, like if you're doing an ng-repeat in Angular, I'm not sure if you could use both, like if you wanted to do a template repeat like this or if you wanted to do an ng-repeat. I'm not, I'm not really sure. But you'll, you'll see that you know, we've got the double curly brace um, that specifies this is a variable and I'm going to be populating it with this um, object and property. So, um, and then if you've ever done anything with Angular and conditional styling, this should look somewhat familiar where you're just 
you set a variable that is going to populate your, your background color here. Does this look scary to anyone? Or I mean, I I was amazed at how easy it was to, to quickly build something that looked really nice and then actually was you know functional. Not a I'm really really big into not building. I've done it before, but I don't want to build another to do application. <laughs> so this is my. I, I've done two applications now that are not to do. Like I built one. I think I did a presentation almost a year ago about uh, this thing called Now Playing, which shows a bunch of movies. When I switched it to music, and now I'm showing a bunch of music. Um, so let's go look at one other thing. I guess I can do that. So th this was my this was my one custom element that I created that I was pretty proud of. Uh, one thing that you'll see a lot of in uh, the material design is that they try to pull colors from the imagery. So you'll have a you'll have like a I think if we can go back to that web page. Here it is. You'll see that on in this, the colors are dynamic. So they're they're pulling a dominant color from each of these images. So if you look at that picture in the bottom right that has all that pink in there, you'll see that the, the text on the bottom is in, is white text on a pink background. And so I thought, okay, well they don't they, Polymer hasn't built that in, and I'm actually going to I'm going to do my best to create a custom paper element that will um, grab the dominant color. And so I, I had my first little attempt at it here, where I created this. So there's a library out there called Color Thief. It's um, made by the same guy who did Lightbox. So you probably have used Lightbox before. Um, so you may or may not know he also created a, a JavaScript library, or a script that just grabs the dominant color from an image and uses canvas and all this other cool stuff that I don't know anything about, <laughs> but I used his library. So um, all my custom element is is this little template here where I, I set up an image. So to get Color Thief to work, you actually have to have an image that, it can, that has size. Um, so or no, actually that is on the, that actually gets downloaded. Which I don't know if it does get downloaded if I have display none. Anyway, this works. Trust me. <laughs> um, so just using the color thief uh, object that he's created, I pass in the source of the image and say get the color. And what it does is it brings back these RGB values, which I then converted to uh, hex. And then based on the, the thing that I, where I took it a step further was I said, okay, let's say that, that color is, say that dominant color is black. Well, I'm not going to want like really dark gray text sitting on black, so you're not going to be able to read it. So I found this function on Stack Overflow of all places, the greatest place to find code. Um, that will d determine the contrast, and based on this, based on running this right here, which I'm not really sure what it does, um, will either give me a, a dark gray color or white based on the dominant color. So if we look at what I created again, you can see here that for like this album cover, it's a light color, so it gave me black text. I'm not sure why I gave this one black text, but here's here's another example at the top where it had a really dark purple, but it gave me white text. So all of these colors are dynamic, and so any image that I throw, I, this is all running off of the JSON file. So any image that I throw at this at this player, it's going to give me the dominant color for the bottom text, and then the uh, set the text color to the you know. I guess the opposite. What would you call it? Hue, <laughs> saturation. <laughs> you have a designer. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, it'll make it legible. Okay, so <laughs> can I use it now? 
yes, and then in small text, but not everywhere. <laughs> so if you work at a health insurance company in the state of North Carolina that services 3 million members that range from, I don't know what our, how old our oldest member is, old to the, as young as somebody can be to actually use a computer and look, log into member services, you won't be able to use it. Because um, we support IE 8 and up. Just recently started supporting just IE 8 and up. Um, but if you're in a position like me where you can, um, where you're also doing mobile development and you've thought about using PhoneGap and you can start targeting newer devices. Or you have mobile web, dedicated mobile web. Or, yeah, or dedicated mobile web and your analytics say, well, hey, we have everybody on iOS 7 and Android devices, the majority of them are 4 and up. Um, it's a great option. And then if you're building, like, if you're building out your portfolio because you want a really cool new job, how is it easiest? Not that he does. No. Yeah. I, I still, I've been working at Blue Cross for four years now, and I, I kind of like it there. Um, really likes it. It'll be four in October. So here's their, uh, Luke was sort of touching on this. So with Polymer, uh, you can see that that top piece is that polyfill. So that this is what I was talking about before. If you're talking native, even even Chrome doesn't even support some of the stuff that's coming. Now the stuff we we talked about, Chrome supports it with the current stakeholder. Um, there are there is a time that you can go set. Um, yeah, I can show you. I, I, I forgot. The it's name. like Chrome colon slash slash flags. flags. And then it's called web platform. You search for web platform. Firefox also has it, but um, custom element. So it has some support natively. You go turn the flag on in Firefox. Everything else is you have to have the all. So if you, if you could say, yeah, these are the only two things that people use, you're, you're free to go. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think, I mean, they're, they're, they're obviously forward thinking, and they don't want to spend all the time that the guys from Angular and jQuery have spent trying to support older browsers when they know that they end up just bloating their, well, their code part, base. Part of it is because of the version of JavaScript that those other browsers are running, it just can't. Like, there's no way to polyfill some of the things. So it's so some people have been up in arms about the fact that you know they're not doing backports and things like that. It's because, I mean, like, you know, take IE8. There's no index of on an array. You have to polyfill that. You can't imagine like with with future stuff that IE8 is ever going to be able to support it. So, well, I just think of the like. The power of the of the JavaScript engine in IE8. I mean, if you've run ng repeat over <laughs> a, lar a large list, you'll see IE8 just like crawl to a you know sl no, slow to a crawl. Crawl to a slow. Crawl to a slow. <laughs> Get really slow. Okay, so uh, they have this. They, I don't know if you guys have, have seen this, but on their web, on the polymerproject.org website, they've got this link to this thing called the Polymer Designer. And using Polymer, they built a drag and drop sort of interface where you can go and play around with all of the different elements. You can just drag them out onto the screen. You could do the paper tabs. You could you could actually build a full blown application using this. And uh, it allows you to view the source code. Actually, you know, let's just do this really fast. It was broken earlier today, so if it doesn't work, I apologize. But um, so if I wanted to create, let's do the, I like the paper tabs. So 
So you can just, I mean, you really can just drag this stuff out on the screen, and then if you want access to the code, you can you can then see all of the code that they've generated for you. So once again, you could just copy and paste this stuff, add it to your page, and you'd be up and running. Uh, and you can also save it. Uh, and this may this may be a myth, but um, I swear I heard them say at Google I/O that they had a Salesforce developer. A Salesforce guy used this and rebuilt their entire mobile application using Polymer. Not the entire thing, but I think a section of it. Using Polymer just by using this designer. So I don't know. It's, worth, I, it's, it's definitely worth checking out. I couldn't get it to save today. Uh, I was getting all kinds of errors. I don't know if it was my network at work. Um, but you can also save these as, uh, as, I think they get saved as a gist on GitHub. So you can then go back and share the code, and copy and paste it again. And then pretty much everything that I've covered today is on polymerproject.org. Um, the, there's some guys that are working on it. Uh, Eric Vitalman or Vital or... And, I'll tag him so he can correct you. And Rob Dotson. Rob Dotson is a really good resource for all things web components, Polymer or otherwise. So, um, yeah, that's kind of it. I, so all of my code is at uh, github.com slash kylebuch8. I've got this presentation up on christinekyle.com. Um, all of the... All of the stuff that I have learned is mainly from that Topeka application that I showed you right at the beginning. It has, uh, it pretty much takes you through the entire flow of an application with getting data, with saving data, with uh, passing data around. Uh, there's a lot of things that I didn't touch having to do with uh, layout. Uh, they've solved tons of layout problems. Actually, you know what, let's just really fast. I want, this is so cool. No, well, not elements, sorry. Uh, people clap at I.O. when they said that they've done the holy grail, which is to... <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> this uh, self-center. So you can... You can vertically and horizontally center an element just by using horizontal a div with horizontal layout and then adding a self-center attribute to something. And it'll just put it right in the middle. I mean, they've got all kinds of cool stuff with alignment here just by adding attributes to your divs. Um, Like all, all of these elements here are using those, those layout attributes. Um, like the, this text down here at the bottom where it says paper tigers, that's all vertically centered just using the attributes. I didn't, I did, the CSS that I did for this is so minimal. Most of it is just using the, the layout attributes. So, all right, well, that's, that's it. Any questions, comments? They've got a whole article on that, and there's like three ways to do it. Um, there's one way is to um, you can add attributes to every single element that you create, and I can show you that code really fast. So app. So take this attribute right here, this song equals song. Um, this is the attribute that gets passed around to the player as well as to the list that says, well, okay, now, now that you've selected this item, I want you to actually show this song. So just by using the song attribute and populating it with the song object, if you were to look at my song file at the top, you'll see I've got these attributes set up where I just include the word song as a string, 
and as soon as song gets populated or gets set somewhere else, this one automatically updates. So when I was when you push the play button, where did all my stuff go? There it is. So when I push the play button here, it knows to play the song here. And if I pause it, let's say I pause it down here, it knows to pause it. Because I have a, if you look at the code here, I have this current song attribute that I've, that I've passed in. And if the song is playing, the song is playing, it knows to do either a pause or a play arrow. So that's one way. And the other way is this, this thing called uh, core signals. It's a tag. It's a, an element. And you can fire your custom elements and pass custom data around. And so anything anywhere up or down the tree will listen for it. And, and that's all based around those callbacks in the web. So there was the one about the attribute changing. And so it's all it's all listeners. You know, they've, they've wired all that together to say, hey, that may change. Yeah. So they uh, the thing about Polymer is they've also included some things that aren't included with web components. So observe um, is coming to browsers natively, but it's not here yet. So they've created a polyfill for observe. So if you just want to, you can actually, and when you're creating your Polymer script here that says that this is my song. You can add a observe attribute and pass in an object of strings that says that, um, or key value pairs, that I want to listen for this object or this property. And when it does, when it changes, I want to run this function. So you'd have your, your, <laughs> your property that you're watching and then your function that you call. And then uh, the other way to pass data around, this, this bubbles up, is at the very top of main action, you'll see it says this.fire main. So um, using this.fire within Polymer will shoot a, a, um, an event up the chain. Uh, so I tried, have, I tried using this to pass uh, data around between children, and it didn't, it didn't work. So core signals is what I had to start using. There's a whole there's a whole site of Google components that you can use. Um, they've got like Google OAuth or Google Sign In, which I've, I'm working on my first uh, pull request on for that. 